Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Sanford, and I'm a PhD student here in the Cool Worlds Lab. And I'm here to tell you about a new paper I've been working on with David Kipping. So this paper is about a few things, uh, and I've debated about the best order to introduce them, because uh, they're all really interesting. They could probably each have their own video. Um, but I'm going to start with our scientific question. Over the past 25 years, we've discovered thousands of exoplanets. And in that process, we've learned that multi-planet systems, where you have more than one planet orbiting the same star, are very common. Some well-known examples, I mean, the solar system, of course, has eight. Uh, TRAPPIST-1 has seven. Uh, Kepler-11 has six. Uh, K2-222 has uh, one so far. Uh, but we're rooting for you, K2-222. Someday, get that second planet. And the number of planets that belongs to any particular planetary system is called that system's multiplicity. Is he safe with that razor? I mean, yeah, we take the blade out. So a one-planet system has a multiplicity of one, a two-planet system has a multiplicity of two, etc. And from the Kepler survey, among other surveys, we know a little bit about multiplicity. Uh, we know that multiplicity 1 is very common, multiplicity 2 is, is also common, uh, but they kind of get less common. So currently there's only one eight-planet system that's listed in NASA's confirmed planets table. Uh, by the way, that's one eight-planet system other than the solar system. Um, the solar system doesn't get listed in the confirmed planets table because we're still waiting for radial velocity confirmation of Mercury. And I've been in grad school so long that I can't tell if that's a funny joke. <laughs> so what we'd like to know, and what David and I set out to investigate in this paper, is how common are the different multiplicities overall? And is there some kind of simple mathematical rule that describes them? And the reason this is interesting is because it could tell us something about planet formation. Um, just as a really extreme example, this isn't true, but just for illustration, if we found that one planet systems are really common and 10 planet systems are really common, but there's nothing in between, then we might start to suspect that there's two different planet formation pathways that lead to one planet systems and 10 planet systems, um, but no intermediates. On the other hand, if there were some kind of smooth multiplicity distribution, we might suspect that there's only one formation pathway, but it's playing out in subtly different ways around different stars. So that's our starting point, and that's our question. Uh, what do these multiplicities look like? And you may already be thinking, wait a second, we haven't discovered every planet that's out there. Uh, even in the systems we do know of, some of those one-planet or two-planet or even six-planet systems are guaranteed to have sibling planets that we just haven't detected. And that's fully true. Some planets are too small to detect with our current instrumentation, and that means that the kind of underlying sizes of exoplanets influence the multiplicities that we ultimately measure. Some other planets are just unfortunately misaligned, meaning that even if we detect one transiting planet, for example, if there's another but its orbit is tilted, uh, we won't necessarily see it. And that means the, uh, the mutual inclinations between planets, whether they're kind of, they tend to all be lined up in a nice flat plane or they tend to have those tilts, um, that will influence the multiplicities we measure too. So that leads me to the second kind of point of interest about this study, which is that it's an interesting exercise in trying to make inferences about the truth in the face of very incomplete information. Um, and even in trying to navigate these kind of layers of hazy understanding to get down to the truth. So just to summarize, um, what we think is going on out there in the universe is that there's some true distribution of multiplicities, um, but we only have access to it through our kind of very biased observations. Um, the multiplicities we know about are mediated by the sizes and the mutual inclinations of exoplanets, which means we have to think about those things too. So what we end up doing is we pick a bunch of different hypotheses for that underlying true multiplicity distribution. Just to take some examples, maybe it's flat, maybe every multiplicity is equally likely, maybe it's kind of sloping, so one planet systems are the most likely, then two planet systems are less likely, all the way down to eight or ten planet systems being quite unlikely. Then we simulate a population of fake planets generated according to that underlying multiplicity rule. And we ask, uh, if we were to miss out on a realistic number of these, because some are too small, because others are misaligned, would the ones that we do see match the observed Kepler multiplicities or not? So we do that for 10 different models or 10 different hypotheses about multiplicity. And what we find is that one that's kind of sloping, where the one planet systems are the most common and then higher multiplicities get progressively less common, uh, that's the hypothesis that matches the data the best. 
So this is really interesting for two reasons. Um, the first being that we're not the first research group that's ever run an experiment like this. Uh, and in particular, I want to point you to a really nice series of papers by Sarah Ballard, who did a similar experiment looking at multiplicities of cooler stars um, than we're looking at in this paper, but found that she needed to invoke two populations of planets combining to make the observed multiplicities that she saw. So she needed a population of single planets and a population of multi-planet systems. And that's not what we're finding here. We're finding that we can explain all of the multiplicities with just this one sloping multiplicity rule. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how those two different hypotheses hold up as test data keeps rolling in. The second reason this is interesting is that the kind of sloping distribution that we found matched the multiplicities the best is a distribution that we actually borrowed from the world of linguistics. This distribution is called Zipf's Law, and it pops up all over the place in all kinds of unexpected data sets. Um, and it says, for example, uh, that if you rank words in a language by their frequency, you find that the second most common word appears about half as often as the first most common word, the third most common word appears about a third as often as the first most common word, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we're finding that planetary multiplicity seem to have similar behavior. So that's not magic. Uh, there's some really cool mathematical work that shows that if you take kind of any well-behaved statistical distribution and you rearrange it to describe those sorts of rank-ordered frequencies, uh, then the Zipf's law behavior pops out. But it's still a really cool connection. So one last thing. Uh, now that we've found that this Zipfian distribution matches the observed multiplicities, we can ask what that implies for the unobserved multiplicities. Uh, in other words, if we assume that the Zipfian is the underlying truth, we can ask what's the mismatch between that truth and our observations? Or how many unseen and undiscovered planets are lurking out there? And when we add up all the planets that are predicted by the Zipfian and subtract the planets that we've already observed, we can calculate that there might be uh, roughly twice as many planets out there than we currently see. And that's just the planets that are hiding in the currently known planetary systems. So that's really good motivation for going back to look again at the known Kepler planetary systems because those undiscovered sibling planets are, are waiting for us to find them. Um, that's all for now. Uh, ask your questions below and subscribe to see more updates from Cool Worlds.